Part three of Schubert and His Work by Herbert F. Pieser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three Der Erlkönig. In the year following Gretchen am Spinnrade, there came into being, and once more in his father's school at the Soilengasse, what is, in some ways perhaps, the most famous of Schubert's songs, Der Erlkönig. Spahn, who went to visit his friend one afternoon, found him all aglow, a book in hand, reading Goethe's ballad. Schubert walked up and down the room several times, suddenly seated himself at a table, and in the shortest possible time the splendid ballad was on paper. Franz, having no piano, the pair hastened down to the convict, where the song was tried out that very evening several listeners objected to the sharp dissonances of the accompaniment to the child's cry but it was none other than old rusica who showed himself the best modernist of them all actually championing the cacophony explaining its artistic function and praising its beauty schubert himself had a pair of sore wrists from the unmerciful triplets of the piano part not everywhere one regrets to say did der erlkönig create such a stir at the insistence of his friends schubert sent it along with some other songs to goethe with an appropriate dedication his excellency in weimar did not even deign to acknowledge it meanwhile the publishing firm of breitkopf and hertel to whom spahn also dispatched the ballad thought that someone was playing a practical joke before deciding what to do with wild stuff they addressed themselves to a dresden violinist who chanced also to be called franz schubert he composed a trifling piece called the bee which some fiddlers still play and asked his opinion the saxon franz or francois schubert exploded insisted he had never composed the cantata in question but would see who was misusing his good name for such a patchwork and promptly bring the miscreant to book piano composition ecossaises german dances deutsche variations sonatas a number of string quartets and other chamber music swelled the ever-increasing output the quantity of songs mounted like a tidal wave and although nothing had come of des teufels Luschloss, part of which the composer moved by purely artistic impulses even went so far as to rewrite schubert continued the woeful job of piling up unwanted operatic scores he wrote der vierjährige posten the story of a sentry who was posted and not relieved on the departure of his regiment and who when it returned four years later still stood on duty fernando a singspieler claudine von villa bella die freunde von salamanca and adrast text by johann meyerhofer and while we are on the operatic subject let us look ahead into the years of schubert's maturity and list what other operas he wrote it should be understood by the way that certain of these are more on the order of operettas than what we understand by lyric dramas in eighteen nineteen he composed the schwillingsbrüder which has a plot along a comedy of errors lines in eighteen twenty a magic and machine comedy called die sauberharfe the magic harp the overture of which is familiar to us as the rosamunde though the overture which schubert used three years later to the musical play of that name was the introduction that prefaced a full-length romantic opera alfonso und Estrella, dated eighteen twenty one an actual overture to rosamunde was never written the piece known universally by that title was not so designated till eighteen twenty seven when it was published in an arrangement for piano duet other operatic works we may cite in passing r d verschwarenen a treatment of the lysistrata motif and the large-scale heroic romantic opera fierabras composed in the summer of eighteen twenty three after eighteen twenty three schubert let opera alone at least temporarily on his deathbed he was still planning another a graf von gleichen to a book by his boon companion edward von bauenfeld 
but the project had never gotten beyond some sketches meyerhofer whom we just mentioned had made schubert's acquaintance in eighteen fourteen when the composer set to music his poem am see a close friendship immediately sprang up between them though meyerhofer the older of the two by ten years was of a moody brooding nature he subsequently committed suicide by jumping out of a window by eighteen nineteen schubert having grown heartily sick of schoolmastering some time before went to share for a time the sombre dilapidated quarters of meyerhofer in the Strasse the danger of the army draft was now over and the pair for all their temperamental differences hit it off famously although schubert composed pretty much anywhere and everywhere he accomplished a prodigious amount of creative work in meyerhofer's depressing room the poet on opening his eyes in the morning used to see franz clad only in shirt and trousers writing vigorously at a rickety table his favorite working hours were from six in the morning till noon though he was in the habit of sleeping with his spectacles on in case the lightning of inspiration should strike him the minute he awoke if any visitor came unannounced schubert would greet him without looking up from his work with the words greetings how are you well whereupon the intruder realized it was an invitation to disappear after writing all morning schubert like a true viennese usually went to enjoy the incomparable relaxation of a coffee-house drinking a melange cafe au lait eating kipferl crescents if you prefer smoking and reading the newspapers in the evening there was the opera and the theatre provided one had money or somebody bought the tickets or else the gatherings of the clans at the various gasthäuser stammbeisel and taverns the friends discussed questions of the day literature plays music they criticized each other's work with unsparing frankness schubert's uncommonly keen musical opinions were relished by everybody although schubert wished to have done with teaching as soon as possible he attempted perhaps to placate his father to obtain a pedagogical post in a normal school at laibach he was turned down in favour of some local applicant which was no doubt just as well had it been otherwise the brilliant coterie of schubertians might have been nipped in the bud and the term schubertiades as they called their revels and their discussions had it entered the dictionary at all might have had another meaning who were these schubertians this group of younger and older intellectuals and bohemians held together somehow by the indefinable attraction of schubert's personality they came and went with the years and when one or another vanished a different one would generally take his place kan er was what's he good at was franz's usual query if a newcomer appeared a question which earned him the nickname Kanavas. virtually all who stepped into the charmed circle were good at something among the most prominent were spahn meyerhofer stadler zen and later moritz von schwind the painter the kupfelweiser brothers leopold and joseph joseph guy karl enders the poet matthias collen the blue-stocking novelist caroline Pichner, edward von barnfeld franz von schober to cite only a handful that come to mind schober particularly who wrote drew acted and was in every sense a clever man of the world played a considerable role in schubert's life some even hint a rather nefarious one still he was well to do his rooms were at franz's disposal whenever he needed them and he introduced the composer to the great michael vogel the latter whom schubert had long worshipped at the opera was not only one of the greatest baritones of his time but a singular and romantic creature who became a social favourite on the strength of his handsome face and figure developed some harmless affectations yet remained a mystic at heart he passed much of his spare time reading the bible plato epictetus and other ancient and medieval poets and philosophers he greeted schubert in the condescending manner assumed by some popular artists when they first met aspiring beginners 
he seemed unimpressed on glancing over the first song or two schubert put before him but after reading through der earl Koenig, he patted the composer on the back remarking as one not wholly dissatisfied there's something in you but you're too little of an actor or a charlatan you squander your fine thoughts without developing them yet before long he had become schubert's chief interpreter and propagandist and spoke grandly of these truly godlike inspirations these revelations of musical clairvoyance the chamber music concerts given on sundays at the schubert homestead in lichtenthal had outgrown their strictly domestic character quite some time before father schubert had been transferred late in eighteen seventeen to a new school in the neighboring rossau district the string quartet had expanded into a small orchestra and now performed symphonies and such in the homes of several musical acquaintances lastly in that of a wealthy landowner anton pettenkopfer who lived in the inner town not far from st stephen's it was for this amateur orchestra that schubert composed at least four of his early symphonies the occasional absence of drums and trumpets in the fifth for instance indicates the constitution of the orchestra at different times schubert himself occupied a viola desk delighting like mozart and bach before him to be in the middle of the harmony up to eighteen eighteen there had not been what one might describe as public performances of schubert's works other than church music on march one there occurred the first of these at a musical declamatory academy that is to say a miscellaneous concert organized by a violinist edward Yale. one of schubert's pieces heard was a so-called italian overture it was surprisingly well received by the critics and in less than three weeks other schubert overtures were heard in vienna at similar entertainments one aristocratic hearer prophesied in type and correctly as it proved that schubert's works would occupy an advantageous place among the productions of the present day only a little earlier franz had the satisfaction of seeing a composition of his appear for the first time in print it was a setting of meyerhofer's poem am erlafse and it was published in a kind of pictorial guide for friends of interesting localities in the austrian monarchy financially schubert reached in the spring of eighteen eighteen a rather desperate pass as he was earning nothing and could not depend everlastingly on his friends so when the father of the singer caroline unger recommended him to count johann esterhazy of galanta as piano teacher for his two young daughters schubert accepted out of sheer need much as he detested teaching of any kind the summer estate of this branch of the esterhazy family was at zelst in the hungarian slovakian frontier land actually not far from vienna but for schubert the farthest away he had ever been the pay was not generous but at least board and lodging were free the country was a relief after the summer heat in vienna the esterhazys and their friends were not unmusical the daughters maria and caroline were thirteen and eleven respectively whom schubert found amiable children he is now and then represented as having been in love with caroline if he really was it could only have been on his second visit to zelitz in eighteen twenty four when she had become a young lady of seventeen like haydn schubert was quartered with the servants which does not seem greatly to have irritated him despite the boorishness of certain grooms a pretty chambermaid he wrote home sometimes kept him company the chief annoyance came from the cacklings of a nearby flock of geese one man whom schubert met at zelitz was destined to become as inspired and outstanding an interpreter of his songs as vogel karl freiherr von schoenstein whose singing of schubert later drew tears of emotion from liszt he brought to the more lyrical songs an extraordinary artistry sensitiveness and devotion the schoenemüllerin cycle in particular was to be his specialty and zelitz both now and a few years afterwards enriched schubert still further by fertilizing his inspiration with slavic and hungarian folk music 
i compose and live like a god he wrote his brother ferdinand though to schober he speaks in a less exuberant strain however the esterhazys and schoenstein sang not a little of schubert's music and also ventured on more or less of haydn's creation and seasons as well as upon the whole of mozart's requiem strangely enough though he had far more time to write songs during these carefree months than he had some years earlier he wrote appreciably fewer his maturing genius was about to take other directions schubert returned to vienna in november in a jubilant mood this was the period when joseph hüttenbrenner brother of the shrewder anselm and sometimes rather irritating to the composer by the injudiciousness of his enthusiasm everything i write seems to please him said schubert querulously made it his business to collect from near and far every manuscript of franz he could lay his hands on in this manner josef recovered fully a hundred songs a fortunate thing for posterity though at the time it buttered no bread and paid no bills anselm for his part went with schubert in a remote gallery seat to the first performance of the latter's opera die zwillingsbrüder the applause warranted the composer's appearance for a curtain call but he declined to take it because of the shabby coat he wore anselm wanted franz to put on his for a moment but schubert declined glad perhaps to escape even a brief lionizing so he merely sat back and smiled wistfully when vogel came forward to tell the audience that the author was not in the house one of schubert's most influential acquaintances about this time was leopold sonleitner a member of a noted viennese musical family it was through sonleitner that schubert came to know the poet heinrich von Collen, and in his circle the composer met men like the so-called music count dietrichstein the poet and bishop ladislaus pricker patriarch of venice court secretary ignaz von mosel and others well qualified to be his patrons and helpers had he but exerted himself to gain their assistance and good will better still sonleitner introduced him to the four enchanting frilich sisters whose father had been a merchant of considerable means josefina kati barbara and anna frilich viennese to the core were uncommonly musical all four sang well three of them taught and barbara painted miniatures one prominent guest of this delightful household was the poet franz grillparzer who long outlived schubert and wrote his epitaph sonleitner cleverly brought some of schubert's songs to the furlich home before introducing the composer in person and whetted the curiosity of the sisters to such a degree that the stage was ideally set for his entrance kete frilich tells of schubert's joy when music not necessarily his own particularly pleased him he would place his hands together and against his lips and sit as if spellbound once after hearing the sisters sing he exclaimed now i know what to do and shortly afterwards brought them a setting of the twenty-third psalm for four women's voices and piano another time anna Frölich appealed to schubert to set some verses of grillparzer's as a birthday serenade to one of her pupils louise gosmer schubert glanced at the poem a couple of times murmuring how beautiful it is and then announced it is done already i have it a few days later he returned with the serenade zürgend Liza, and the charming piece was sung shortly afterwards beneath louise gosmer's window characteristically schubert forgot to come and he almost missed his work on a later occasion when it was sung at a concert devoted wholly to his compositions when he finally did hear it he seemed like one transfixed truly he murmured i did not think it was so beautiful End of part three